Perfect, everyone. It's so good to see so many of you turn out for what should be a really intriguing talk today. Uh, before we get started, uh, some brief announcements uh, by Susan Eckert about upcoming Art League uh, activities. So, Susan? Thanks for letting me take cuts. <laughs> uh, Art League, Kalamazoo Art League is a membership organization. Any Kalamazoo Institute of Arts member is eligible to join and our programs are open to the public. I just wanted to remind folks that next Wednesday, Art League is hosting Dr. Talisa Fleming, who is uh, a founding curator at the Smithsonian's Museum of African American History and Culture, and she helped develop the American art collection there. So we're excited to welcome her to Kalamazoo. I put out a few little flyers. There's our program next week, next month, and also a trip in the works. So feel free to pick it up and thank you for letting me take cuts here. <laughs> Jim. Oh, great. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Susan. Well, we often don't normally associate humor with art. Uh, art, after all, has this aura of seriousness and uh, high purpose and so forth. And it uh, just seems sort of the antithesis. And yet, from really the earliest times, humor has always kind of found its way into artistic creation, sometimes at the margins or the edges. Um, in the fifth century, uh, of course, the great period of Greece, uh, Greek, uh, vase painting, and so among these images of gods and goddesses and heroes and great deeds, you also find depictions of drunken satyrs uh, carousing at a party. And despite being so far removed in time, it's authentically funny. You don't have to know about mythology to kind of get the picture. And I think that's one of the neat aspects of visual humor. Of course, humor became more prominent in art uh, during the 18th and 19th century when the rise of democracies in Europe and America and art was used in newspapers, pamphlets, and journals as a way of uh, political commentary or satire. And the artists who did that um, had a great deal of broad uh, public appeal. The 20th century, of course, brought a profusion of new movements and styles and approaches. And it became very interesting how humor began to work its way into these in some interesting and unexpected ways. And it's uh, going to be the focus of our talk today. Uh, we're very pleased to have with us once again, Dr. James Carter. Uh, Jim, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, is a retired um, physician. Uh, he had a clinical practice here in Kalamazoo for 36 years. And his connection with the KIA, I think even is older than that. He started out as a photography student, uh, later became a board member, uh, the director of a board, and what I think is particularly significant, a docent. Um, these are the people who give the tours to the public and are kind of on the front lines of you know, awakening an interest to uh, the general public, and uh, that's a, a challenging job. In his past presentations uh, here, Jim has always brought in a connection between art and um, medicine and how health and sickness and other things really affect or influence not only the culture but the art that it produces. And uh, so we've had some intriguing talks on like, the bubonic plague. It's nice that we're kind of progressing now to humor, which again has a therapeutic <laughs> aspect and which you see, and uh, I think uh, makes an intriguing sort of continuation of his talks. So, uh, please welcome Jim Carter. Thank you very much. Um, I don't deserve that introduction, but thank you. Humor is actually one of the most interesting and bizarre aspects of mankind. We're the only mammals that use humor. Uh, funny drawings, as Craig has mentioned, has been found in prehistoric caves, uh, in uh, ancient Egypt. Uh, they've been found on walls of Pompeii. Um, Aristotle defined humor as a contrast between the expectation and the actual outcome. In fact, he went on to say that the greater that difference is, the more amusing is the humor or the more violent is the laughter. So in the world of art, this is how I see 
the different types of humor. And um, we're going to talk a lot about satire, sarcasm, and caricature uh, in humor. And that's often to affect change. It's often looked at uh, politics. It's looking at injustices in society. Uh, the presentations can be quite devastating. We'll see actually a couple of those. And the results of the sarcasm, uh, satire, and caricature can be also quite devastating. Um, now, you'll see a fair amount of Stephen Hansen in this talk. I think he's a hilarious uh, artist. And I would maintain that this uh, paper mache sculpture is, in fact, both a pun and just plain fun. So it's quite whimsical. Let's start with our basic definitions. And our basic definition, humor is intellectual. In other words, it's a cognitive event. We have to recognize what is humorous. We have to think about it oftentimes, particularly in the uh, visual uh, world. So the, the viewer has to relate to the image and it's very cultural. And we'll see some, some slides here, some uh, etchings uh, from uh, 2000 or 200 years ago that may not be particularly funny to us, but they were hilarious at the time. So we have humor as being intellectual. We have mirth as being that emotion. And that emotion is at several different levels. That emotion is at the brain level. We're going to talk about that in a second. It's also that warm, fuzzy feeling throughout your body that you feel when something is, in fact, uh, humorous. And then laughter. Laughter is basically just a physical expression of humor. Let us recall that laughter is a very powerful communication tool. So this is the only neurophysiology slide I'm going to show. Um, but I want you to be aware of some words. And uh, when I learn new things, I always do word association. So my word association for you, when, when I say endorphins, you think opiates, okay? So think of the opiate receptors of the brain. So when I stimulate this neuropeptide in my brain that's called endorphin, then I relieve stress, I turn on pleasure, I relieve pain, you know, I heighten my excitement. It's a high. It's a high, and that's an opiate. So that's the endorphin. When I say dopamine, you think pleasure system. So you think the pleasure system of your brain. This is a neurotransmitter, and it provides enjoyment and motivation. When I say serotonin, think mood stabilizer. And you've heard the term serotonin, or the word serotonin used in some drugs. So serotonin is a mood stabilizer. It gives you a sense of well-being. It smooths out your mood, if you will. And then oxytocin is actually a, a peptide from the pituitary. So this, rather than just stay in the brain, it goes throughout the entire body. So you perhaps have heard of oxytocin when it was used in labor and delivery as a smooth muscle contractor to contracture to uh, stimulate uh, labor. Uh, in the brain, our buzzwords are bonding, trust, and love. And so oxytocin is very high in the postpartum period. It's done for, for uterine contraction, but also it's very high to help with bonding, trust, and love. So those are the buzzwords I want you to remember, and there is a quiz at the end of the program. Um, voluntary smiling and evoked humor are much different. I can sit here, I can smile all day long. It's not doing a thing for my brain other than turning on the muscles of facial contraction. But evoked humor is quite different, and we're going to see this in a second. The brain handles verbal and visual humor much differently. And again, I'll show you that, uh, I think, dramatically in a second. Visual humor is much more easily remembered. A picture is truly a thousand words, and you add humor to it, and it's 2,000 words. If I add music to the humor, it's 4,000 words. Okay, so, you know, we can just keep building on to that. Well, let's do an experiment. Foster Brooks famously said, I woke up this morning with a terrible hangover to the sound of my neighbor mowing his lawn. I was going to get up, then I thought, nah, he can mow around me. <laughs> okay, this is humor, this is verbal humor. And in fact, verbal humor kind of created more humor, more laughter in the room. That's the advantage of verbal humor. Let's look at this, Renee Magritte, not to be reproduced. Okay, some of you are smiling, laughing, and I see some grins. I see some people scratching their head going, really? Really? Uh, I find uh, Magritte just uh, hilarious, if you will. Uh, here we see uh, a mirror. And we can tell it's a mirror because you look at the book on the right lower side, and you see that's a perfect re reflection of that book. But then you look at the head, you go, well, it's looking at something. But then I see a perfect copy of that head. 
And so you got to think about it. You have to worry about this. You say, hmm, visual humor is different than verbal humor. It takes your time, your thinking, your intelligence to figure this out. When I told the Foster Brooks joke, I controlled the punchline, I controlled the emphasis, I controlled the timing. That's why everybody kind of smiled and laughed at the same time. Here, it took a while for everybody to kind of figure this out. And if you haven't figured it out, raise your hand. I'll... <laughs> Never mind. So the other thing that I love about Magritte is his titles. And so here, not to be reproduced. Reproduction is something that is tells us the truth. It is identical. So in fact, we look at the person back at the head, the young man back at the head. We look in the mirror, and it's identical, but it's not the truth. It's not the truth. So that's one of the reasons I love Magritte. So this is the only neuroanatomy picture I'm going to show. This is the brain. OK, and this is a functional MRI. These are six different views of the brain from the top from the bottom, from right from the left, up and down. So anyway, uh, this is a landmark study in February of 2007. And it's brain activation during sight gags and during visual uh, humor. And there's a difference. Now, this is kind of a culmination of the 20 subjects. But anyway, the, the pink area is a part of your brain that lights up with verbal humor. Not very much. But the blue area is a part of your brain that lights up with visual humor. So I said, you use more of your brain when you're looking at a picture to find out if it's amusing. This, this kind of uh, substantiates that. So uh, verbal humor, much more part of your brain is active. Part of it is because of thinking, but part of it is also some of your memory that goes into this. So the origins of humor, uh, humor binds us together. It binds us together as a family. It binds us together as a region, as a nation, and as a society. So humor is extremely important. Why is it important? Because those people that use humor in society are better problem solvers. They're uh, much more creative, if you will. They have a, a better and improved social interaction, and it's typically positive social interaction. Uh, if you use humor, you can deal with aggression more easily. And the people that use humor are those people that make lemonade from lemons. In other words, they find benefits in adversity. So in addition to all we've talked about, there's a huge advantage in childhood uh, humor. Children that use humor are leaders in the classroom cognitively. They're leaders in the classroom socially. They continue this leadership throughout all the training and into later life. So uh, children that use humor are uh, much more productive in society. And there's a gender difference in humor. Uh, men use uh, humor for status. Women use humor for socialization. What I want to do now is kind of go through a survey, and, and Greg mentioned this, that we've seen humor uh, throughout all of society. I want to just kind of highlight some of the visual humor that we've seen and uh, talk about the particularly golden age of humor in the 18th and 19th century. So as mentioned, there's not a lot of 2D humor uh, in uh, ancient, the ancient world. I'm showing you a mosaic on, the, on, the, uh, on your left. And here we see the uh, clown face. And on the right is an incense burger. We see the same clown, if you will, the same clown face. Again, not a lot of uh, visual humor in the old days, in the Rome and Greek, but a lot of humor, particularly in the theater. And in the theater, they use masks to identify the players. So the comedic mask, if you will, was a comedy player. He was a funny guy. And I say guy because all the actors were men back in the old days. So there was some humor. There was humor on some of the vases, particularly some of the Greek vases, um, but not a lot. Most of art at that time was uh, deification of the gods or Roman generals or emperors or what have you. But there wasn't a genre, a middle class. There's no middle class. And it's really when you have a middle class, we start seeing this art that becomes much more humorous. It's for the middle class people. So uh, carrying on from ancient uh, Rome and, and uh, Greece, we go uh, to Mesoamerica. The Rimaharda culture uh, was a culture that flourished on the Mexican Veracruz coast for about 1,000 years from uh, 800 uh, BC or from 100 BC to uh, 900 uh, the Common Era. So these, this is a pre-Columbian uh, statue, if you will. Uh, it's uh, ceramic, it's hollow. And here the uh, person has got a rattle in his left hand. He's waving with his right hand. He's got this huge grin on his face. 
you know, almost an ear to ear grin, almost a, uh, well, kind of a bizarre grin, almost like he's under hallucinogenic spell, which he probably was because this represents a dancer. So, uh, but we do see uh, comedy in um, um, pre-Columbian times. Now, Greg mentioned that on the, uh, on manuscripts in particular, in the Middle Ages, and medieval times, most of us tend to think of very somber times. In fact, I think it was an extremely somber time. Uh, and there were a number of things going on. There, were, there was actually huge climate change going on in the Middle Ages. There was a plague. There was all kinds of things. But, you know, I've, I kind of gravitated to this because illustrators in the old days, in the medieval times, were copying word for word, letter for letter, 10 hours a day, six days a week. And you can imagine they went stir crazy. They went bonkers. And it was really in the uh, 10th or 1100s where rabbits first appeared in some of the illustrations in manuscripts. And the rabbits were these fluffy, white, frolicky things. They represented nature and they were all happy. But then some of these stir crazy illustrators said, whoa, let's go with killer rabbits. And so these are actually five different illustrations of, of killer rabbits that were written, uh, drawn in the margins of illustrations. So the first one was in 1170, the Ariston Passional. And there was the first time we saw the killer rabbits. And then it continued for about 200 years. Um, the um, killer rabbit in the right upper side, the, the jousting one, that was in a book of hours in England from uh, 1320. Uh, the others were all depictions of the killer rabbits slaying their uh, hunters, if you will. Um, and some of them actually get really graphic. Um, the the um, uh, uh, Smithville de Chronicles, uh, there's a whole set of cartoons through several pages. And these cartoons, I mean, <laughs> really get quite, quite bloody. Uh, it ends up, um, this is near the end of one of the uh, uh, cartoons where they are they uh, sacrifice a human. So uh, Killer Rabbits, the medieval manuscripts, uh, look it up. It's a fun little read. Uh, and you'll see how uh, you go crazy if you uh, copy for 10 hours a day. Well, I find the Renaissance a, a fascinating era. And uh, this is Venus and Mars. This is by Sandro Botticelli, 8, 1485. This is uh, oil on panel. This is probably a panel that was done for a, a wedding, for an armoire on a wedding. Feast. Perhaps a Da Vinci, we're not sure. But anyway, you say Botticelli, Botticelli, Shazam, I should know that name. Well, yes, you should know that name. Uh, this is Botticelli's most famous painting, and I would argue that this might be one of the most famous paintings of the uh, high Renaissance time, um, certainly in the top 10 or 20 for me, and it's the birth of Venus. And I show this to say uh, famous artists were, in fact, doing humor, like Botticelli, but I also show this to say that, you know, Venus typically in the Renaissance, in the high Renaissance, was depicted in the nude. But here, back on Venus and Mars by Botticelli, she's fully clothed in a very formal gown. I love her facial expression. I find this hilarious. You know, she's looking um, dissatisfied, she's looking frustrated, she's looking angry, she's looking right at Mars, who's kind of passed out, if you will. And one of the great jokes in uh, the Renaissance and medieval times was how a man always fell asleep after any kind of a relationship with somebody. So uh, this was a, a joke on a joke, if you will. We had these satires. Satires are those little impish people, the, the drunken, lustful woodland gods in uh, Greek mythology. And we have uh, a satire with the helmet, and we can all recall kids or grandkids or friends with little kids, where they put the, the hat on, you know, and the hat came over the face, and it was the funniest thing in the world for them. Um, we have another satire here, also holding a spear. We have the satire blowing a conch in Mars' ears, trying to wake him up, if you will. And then we have the satire coming out from the uh, armor below his elbow. So this would be a classic example of humor in medieval time, or in uh, Renaissance times. Well, the northern uh, area, northern Europe, was always much more interested in genre painting than they were in the gods and goddesses. And part of this is because they, in fact, were a Protestant country, not a Catholic country, and they had other things that they could, they could do. So genre painting in the Northern Renaissance is really fascinating. 
So this is uh, the founder from uh, the Flemish Proverbs, uh, Peter Bruegel the uh, Younger. Peter Bruegel the Younger and his father, the Elder, figure that out, um, both were known for their uh, moralizing undertones. They present a sharp, provocative, uh, witty humor, if you will. Now, to really understand uh, this um, painting, this oil and panel, you have to be able to read Flemish and read the words around it. But I'll translate that for you. Uh, the inscription around the frame says, because so much money passes through my purse, I am always surrounded by flatterers. In other words, I'm always surrounded by the suck-ups, if you will. So this is a fairly classic Northern European humor of the uh, 16th of century. I've got to mention that when you start looking at humor and art, particularly humor starting from um, well, medieval time, but through the Renaissance and, and late Renaissance, you see a lot of drunkenness. <laughs> I think if I lived back then, I'd probably be drunk too. Um, this is entitled Yonker, Romp, and His Sweetheart. And I, I really love it. Franz Hals was a, a Dutch Golden Age painter. He was known for his genre works. He was also known for his portraits. He's a really skilled painter. I love um, the facial expressions he gets. But anyway, we are drawn to the sweetheart first. And I'm drawn to her because she's got that white collar. She's got white on her a sleeve, so instantly your eyes go to the right. Then you look at her face and you see these rosy cheeks. You see this uh, very happy smile. Then you see, you see she's, she's all over Yonker. I mean, she's got her hands everywhere just about. So she's into Yonker. Yonker's kind of into her. I mean, he's got the rosy cheeks. He's got that flask up in his hand, either wine or ale or something. Uh, and I, I suspect, I look at this and I think they've had more than one fermented libation by this point. <laughs> Uh, you know, they're pretty happy people. Um, so, you know, the joke, I think, is just looking at their, their facial expressions. Yonker's a pretty relaxed guy. Not only is he being mauled by his girlfriend, but he's petting his dog in the left floor. Uh, uh, if you look down here, I mean, he's, he's uh, got, the, got the dogs. He's got everything he wants. He's got a guy, dog and a woman. What more, can, what more is there in life? So uh, this is Franz Hals, Northern European Dutch artist. Well, this is another guy you've heard of, Rembrandt. Yes, that Rembrandt, that guy. And Rembrandt is notorious for self-portraits. And you know, I've read that he did at least 80 self-portraits. I, I heard a talk the other day that they said more than 100 self-portraits. He did a lot. He really enjoyed doing self-portraits, but it was also cheaper. He didn't pay a model. And he could change expressions. And so this is a, actually a series of five or six that he did in 1630. So he's 24 years of age. He's, I mean, that's awfully good for 24, but he's 24 years of age. And he wanted to study facial expressions. He wanted to study lighting. So he did a series of five or six uh, etchings of self portraits. And here, we're actually looking up into him. So that kind of heightens the amazement, heightens the amusement, heightens the puzzling uh, aspect of his facial expression. So uh, uh, self-portraits were extremely important. Um, the Sleeping Congregation, William Hogarth, uh, Craig alluded to uh, some of the, the, the very famous uh, satirists, the famous uh, characterists. And now we're over in uh, England, so we've crossed the channel. Uh, William Hogarth, um, we'll see a little bit more of his later, but this is one of his oil on canvas. He was really a good artist, by the way, and he was a very productive artist. Um, I, I really, uh, I identify with the, the preacher. I've, I've done talks here and I've looked in the audience. I've seen all the nods because I, I identify with that. I also identify with these people, okay, nodding during, during the service. In fact, that just happened Sunday. Um, so, but I, but I, I draw your attention to this woman. You know, her head's getting ready to slide down this banister. This person here is leaning forward and I'm afraid this person is going to go right into the deck. Uh, here's a deacon, probably, and the deacon can't even keep it together. And if you can see every person in the congregation, every person's eyes are closed. So this is a classic William Hogarth satire on religion. Now, Hogarth was really famous for his modern moral subjects. That's a series of three different types of, of series, if you will. The first one I'm, I want to mention is called The Harless Progress. 
And some of you that have really good memories will recall that the six panels of Harlan, the Harlan's Progress were in the KIA about six years ago for a print show. And they were actually right on the, on the back wall. I remember looking at them going, whoa, this is biting. Whoa, this is tough. So he did the Harlot Progress, uh, progress uh, showing the degradation of being a harlot, if you will. Uh, his second most famous one was called a Rake's Progress. And a Rake's Progress, the rake was a young man who inherited money, and he painted how the rake squandered the inheritance. And the third was Marriage a la Mode, which really slammed the institution of marriage. So Hogarth uh, was one of the biggies, perhaps uh, one of the most influential of the artists for the next uh, three centuries. Now, Greg mentioned that really the golden age of uh, satire began in the 18th century and really has continued, but 18th and 19th century are really important for satire, for picture, and for um, sarcasm. So I show the uh, lithograph press. And lithography was identified, or identified, lithography was, came into being in the late 18th century. Lithography is very basic, oil and water don't mix. So you use a grease pencil on a clear uh, slab, uh, that'll hold the ink and won't hold, uh, and the ink will not stay on, on the slab so you can print. Now, what we've talked about to date uh, has been etchings or engravings or an intaglio process. And remember, uh, when you're doing printing for intaglio, you got to push that ink into those grooves, right? You're going to wipe uh, unused ink off, then you slam it on the paper and use a uh, press. At best, in the old days, you could do 100 an hour. With lithography, it was so much faster, cheaper, you could do 1,000 an hour. So with, with lithography, you could do mass, you could do a, a caricature of, um, of uh, Jim Carter and spread it to the world you know, very quickly with lithography. So that was the key in the golden age of satire and caricature. So let's look at one. Uh, this is J.J. Granville, and now we've gone uh, over to France. And J.J. Granville, uh, that was his pseudonym. And if you look at his work, you can understand why he used a pseudonym. Uh, his real name was G. Ignard Garrard. And uh, he used lithography very early on. This is a hand-colored uh, lithograph. So what they would do is they would print the lithograph and pass it to the next room where young ladies, young women, did all the hand uh, painting, if you will. So uh, J.J. Granville's most famous uh, work is called Metamorphosis of the Day. Metamorphosis of the Day was a series of 70 uh, prints, uh, printed in 1829 and then sold. They were actually sold like a book. And so here we have um, Metamorphosis of the Day. They use uh, human bodies. They use animal faces. And clearly he's making fun of uh, Parisian society, of French the French bourgeois, if you will. So this is a really good example of satire. Here's another example of a satire and a character. This is a, a symphony from Vanity Fair. Vanity Fair was a weekly magazine, a British, so we cross the, the channel again, we're gonna go back and forth. So we cross the channel again. Vanity Fair was uh, from uh, 1868 to uh, 1914, right before World War One, And Vanity Fair uh, was notorious for their uh, caricatures. And this is a caricature by uh, Sir Leslie Ward. He never used that name. He also used a pseudonym called Spy. So if you look up Spy on the internet, uh, Spy characters, caricatures, you'll see uh, Sir Leslie Ward. So this was published in 1878. This is uh, a caricature of James Whistler. James Whistler, that uh, artist that you all know about that uh, was an expat and lived in London. Um, Whistler saw this. He kind of went ballistic, if you will, and said, this is not me. This is horrible. I hate this. It makes me look arrogant. It makes me look like a dandy. It makes me look uh, pretentious. Well, <laughs> whoa, uh, this is not good. Um, so, well, uh, William Merritt Chase, that William Merritt Chase that we have downstairs studying paint, same guy. Chase was going uh, to Spain by way of London, and he wanted to meet uh, Whistler. So uh, they, 
that either he convinced Whistler to do a portrait or uh, all the way around. But anyway, uh, Chase did a portrait of Whistler. And I see this portrait. He, he gave it to uh, Whistler. Whistler said, quote, this is a monstrous lapoon. I refuse to take it. You know, so <laughs> which is a portrait of you and you refuse to take it. That's pretty arrogant. But anyway, I look at the two and I'm going, wow, that portrait of Chase sure does make uh, Whistler look like a dandy. <laughs> sure makes him look arrogant. Sure makes him look pretentious. So then I decided to read more about Whistler. In fact, he was a dandy. He was arrogant. He was pretentious. I think they got it right. I think both of them got it right. So we're going to see some people you don't know, uh, never heard of. And this is a guy named William Sidney Mountain. William Sidney Mountain was considered the greatest of the American, we're now in America, so the greatest American genre painters of the mid 19th century. His dates were 1807 to 1868. So this is called a painter's triumph. This is a classic uh, mount uh, painting. The, the, the palette, the, the colors are warm, the palette's are warm. Um, it, he uses humor a lot. And in here we have the painter kind of representing him, you know, and kind of like an en guard type of a, of a pose pointing to the painting. You know, he has his hair as a stance. His muse is actually that, that thing on the background, that Apollo Belvere, you know, you see that that just kind of his model, if you will. But then he shows kind of a, a, a country hayseed, if you will, gap tooth and the whole bit. And he pointed out the, the uh, importance of his painting. So this would be a classic genre painting, a humorous genre painting of America of the 19th century. Well, not to be outdone, uh, England, or England, Germany also had their genre painters. And this is a Wilhelm Amberg, another name you've never heard of, but he was actually a very famous genre painter of uh, Germany of the uh, 19th century. And his paintings are also characterized by humor. And he described uh, his uh, palette or his backgrounds as poetic atmosphere. I don't know what that meant, but that's what he said. Uh, so this is uh, also entitled The Property of a Noble Lady. Uh, that's the formal title, but it's also called The Maid. So if any of you go online after this and look up The Maid, you can buy this as a reproduction off eBay for $29.99. It's 11 by 14. So The Maid uh, is actually a very famous uh, painting, if you will. Well, let's go from Germany to Spain. And uh, this is Del Caso uh, escaping criticism. And you know, this is just a great, great painting. I think it's one of the funny, funny paintings uh, of all time. By the way, so does Reader's Digest. They said it's one of the top 10 paintings that are humorous. Anyway, um, uh, Dicasso uh, loved Trump Loy. So, you know, this looks like, you know, 3D. It looks like this, this young boy is escaping from the frame. Um, and Dicasso is great at the shadowing. He's great at foreshadowing. He's great at getting that Trump Loy, that realism look uh, to us. So his head's beyond the frame, his foot is halfway out of the frame, and he's using both hands and arms to pull himself uh, through the frame. So um, again, I think this is a, a humorous a painting, but it's also a point of Del Caso uh, was Spanish. Uh, at the time he was painting, the major movements were realism, uh, romanticism. Um, the Salon in Paris, was kind of controlling the entire art world, at least in Europe. And he refused to be a, a romantic painter. He refused uh, to listen to the whims of the salon, if you will. And so he escaped, he escaped his critics, he escaped his fellow artists. So this is almost a self-portrait, but not quite. So back to our friend Magritte, you know, Again, hilarious, hilarious. Rene Magritte uh, did this clairvoyance, if you will. And, you know, the unhatched egg is his, is his point of reference. This is, in fact, a self-portrait. So it's a self-portrait um, of uh, Magritte. And so, you know, in self-portraits, you often, again, have uh, 
references to the, to the job they're doing. In this case, he's painting and he's painting his bird with the egg as a, a reference. Now, this is a good example of a surrealist painter of the 20th century. So I think uh, Magritte, uh, uh, Salvador are, are really very humorous surrealist painters. Some of them are a little bit bizarre. Um, I think too many mushrooms. Um, anyway, um, uh, this is Dr. Clair Clairvoyance. Again, I love his titles with his paintings and Clairvoyance speaking to the future. So he's got the egg, doing the bird, thinking to the future, thinking beyond what's in front of him right now. So um, that's um, agreed. Well, we have to stay in the 20th century. And there is no way in this world I could talk about humor without Norman Rockwell. And not, Norman Rockwell um, did more, he, he's really prolific. I didn't realize this until I got into the to talk. You know, he did over 4,000 original works. He did 321 different covers, mostly for Saturday Evening Post, but other magazines. Uh, typically, Rockwell would do an oil on canvas, and then the magazine would um, get rights to reproduce the oil on canvas. So this is a classic tired sales girl on Christmas Eve. He loved the holidays. Rockwell loved the holidays. And so uh, this was Macy's in Chicago. He went from his home in, in uh, Massachusetts to Macy's in Chicago. And Rockwell was meticulous and exacting to say the least. He, it was said by his historians that he interviewed every single doll at Macy's to get the three dolls they wanted. Uh, he interviewed all, most of the employees ended up getting his protagonist from the diner next door, uh, the young gal who's our protagonist. So funny at many different levels. Above her, sign, above her head, the sign says, we will close at five o'clock Christmas Eve. On her chest, you can see a watch. See the watch hanging down? The watch says 5.05. <laughs> she's slinking down the wall. She's getting ready to collapse. Her shoes are already off. She's rubbing her feet. Her sales book is falling off her lap. The dolls are smiling. She's not, you know? Uh, Rockwell <clears throat> was one of the earlier uh, uh, painters, not the earliest, but one of the earlier painters. He did a lot of photographs. And they were taken back to his studio and put them all together to get his composition. So this is a classic Norman Rockwell, if you will. Now, this is an art collection. I find this hilarious. Uh, Robert Arneson. Arneson is an artist. He was actually known for his ceramics. Now, if I say funk art movement, most of you will raise your hand and say, oh, San Francisco. Yeah, you're all right, San Francisco. He was one of the leaders of the funk art movement that really rebelled against uh, common uh, artistic uh, um, technique, if you will. Uh, they made fun of everything, they made fun of everybody, and they made fun of themselves. So this is a self-portrait of Robert Arneson. And, you know, I look at this, I originally thought he just put his face on a copy machine and, you know, how we should do that in the old days. Well, no, Arneson said, no, I am being prepared for a microscopic examination and my face is being squashed by a, a cover strip and my head's on a, a, a glass slide and the microscope is coming down. So I, I show this because I want to do a quick uh, digression. I want you to remember, remember that Rembrandt that we looked at, okay? Self-portraits are a way of the artist to express humor. They're a way to talk about themselves. They want to say something about their emotional state or who they are. And if you're commissioned to do a portrait for King Louis XIV, you're not going to make it humorous, okay? That's your commission. But if you want to say something about yourself, you can be humorous. So in fact, self-portraits are often very humorous, or, or at least if you look in the background, there's some things that, that uh, get to humor. So humor, or self-portraits are a theme, a theme in, in humor and art. Another theme is this, scar sarcasm and politics. So politics and making fun of society um, are one of the big themes in humor. And, and we, we can't relate to this. I mean, I, I suspect probably only less than half a dozen in the audience know who this is, so I tell you, uh, because we don't really relate to it. But this is, um, you know, this is by James Gilray. This is George, Prince of Wales. This is the future king, you know, and this is a character by James Gilray. Now, he used his real name. I don't know why he used his real name, but he used his real name. 
And you know, this is a caricature, a political satire. There, he was not a fan, obviously, of uh, George, Prince of Wales. Um, but Gilray was considered one of the, one of the great English uh, characterists uh, and satire artists. So here we have George being, you know, kind of laying back, being lacking gentility is, is what was described. He lacked gentility. He was very much into self-indulgence. The um, fork in his uh, left hand is picking meat out of his teeth, but underneath his uh, left elbow is a chamber pot that's overflowing, and on top of the chamber pot there are paid bills. So this is a very, very scathing um, character of George, Prince of Wales. Well, I guess even worse. This is Honor Dumier, and Honor Dumier is French, so I crossed, crossed the channel again. So Honor Dumier is French, and this is the king, King Louis Philippe the First. So this is the king. I mean, you have to have some who spot to do this about the king. Um, I mentioned that early on, some of these uh, caricatures, some of the satire was was uh, almost um, brutal in its presentation, but it also could be brutal in its effect. So here we have people loading tribute onto a steep ramp. And it's feeding into George's face. Dumier always drew, drew George's face, uh, King Louis, sorry, King Louis's face as a pair. So it's always as a pair. And I, I guess the guy had a pretty big jowls, but I mean, he drew it as a pair. So you have all this tribute, all this food going up the steep ramp. Um, King Louis Philippe is on maybe his throne, but Dumier made it look more like a commode. And so you see all this tribute going into his mouth, and then below the commode, you see all these titles, all these uh, things coming out to his cronies. Now, devastating presentation, but devastating effect. The devastating effect is that Dumier was charged with sedition. Dumier spent six months in jail. The uh, stone that this was uh, drawn on, a lithograph stone, was demolished into a thousand pieces. And the magazine that published this was forced out of business within a year. So devastation, devastation. But this is something that, that, that I can, some of you may remember this. I actually did remember this. Um, this is LBJ. And David Levine was considered one of the greatest uh, caricatures of the first half of the 20th century in America. So now we're back in America. And this is the way he always drew LBJ with the big nose, the, the big ears, the sad eyes, and the, and the prominent forehead. He always drew LBJ this way. LBJ had a cholecystectomy. He had a gallbladder surgery. He had a gallbladder surgery while he was in office. And LBJ was kind of a crude, rude guy to begin with. But after his gallbladder surgery, a week after his gallbladder surgery, the White House photographers were around. He pulls up his shirt. And in the old days, the gallbladder surgery was from the medial portion of the right quadrant to the if you're portion of that quadrant, this is 18 inches or more scar. And in the old days, it was a muscle cutting scar. In other words, you cut through the muscles to get the gallbladder. So it was very painful, very uncomfortable. But LBJ rips up the shirt, shows points to the scar. So David Levine said, oh, got to play on this one. So he took the scar and made it look like the country of Vietnam. The country of Vietnam. So, you know, Vietnam was, was Johnson's greatest failure, without a doubt. Uh, David Levine shows him pointing to pain on top of pain, if you will. So this is a, a more recent example of character and satire. So let's go back and look at other themes. And this is probably the most common of all themes in humor and art. This is Unequal Lovers. This is uh, by a, uh, an engraver named Master E.S. In fact, I, I, I can't say that his name was because we don't know who it was. Art historians got a bunch of prints and they start grouping the prints. They say, all these prints look alike. All these prints look alike. Let's name them. Let's give an artist name to them, even though we don't know who the artist is. So Master Yes is not a real person. But this is a classic example from the 15th century. It goes back even to the 14th century of unequal lovers. So here you have the lecherous old man with his eyes kind of staring at the nubile young lady. She's kind of looking askance at him. Uh, on his on the table, 
His arm is surrounding his uh, bag of gold or bag of coins. Uh, she is reaching for it. His hand is kind of pulling it away. But his left hand is coming around behind, and she's pushing that away. So, you know, it's just a classic unequal lover story, if you will. So this is going uh, north. Uh, this is in uh, uh, Holland. This is a no match couple by Lucas Chronic, Lucas Chronic from 1530. And this is uh, on the panel. And again, um, you know, we, you see the lecherous man. You see the lecherous man with his right hand, probably giving coin to the young lady in his left hand. But in his left hand, he's holding that bag of gold and there's gold on the table. Now, which is really hard to see. Um, right there where her hand is, can you see a scale? See the scale? So this is really a business transaction for her, isn't it? So this is a scale. We see gold on the, on the table, but we also see some gold on the scale itself. So, you know, a really good example of, of unequal lovers, you know, the old man, but the real story is in the background. You know, I love this background. In the background, we see a rifle, we see powder horn, we see antlers. So clearly the hunt, the hunt, right? Who's hunting whom? And then we see these dead birds. And this is where culturally, we don't have a chance on this one, but culturally back in the 15th and 16th century uh, in Northern Europe, uh, dead birds were called Vogel, V-O-G-E-L. And Vogel also implied dirty old men. So dirty old men, <laughs> this guy, with all these dirty old men signification in the background. So maybe, you know, the spirit was willing, but the flesh wasn't a type of a thing. So let's carry on with unequal lovers. This is, uh, again, J.J. Granville from Metamorphosis of the Day. Sir, may I offer you my respects to my daughter? You know, so we have, again, J.J. Granville used human bodies with animal heads, animal faces, if you will. And so here we have the fish offering his daughter, which looks to me like, like a pigeon, if you will, to the, to the military guy, to the aristocracy, to the guy who's got more medals than he's got chest, right? He's got medals going down his, uh, the trim, the gold trim on his pants. So, you know, unequal lovers, but this is really biting. This is really cool because look at this. This is a vulture. This is a bird of prey. And what do birds of prey prey on? But fish and unprey birds. So, so it's kind of biting at a couple of different levels and, and humorous at one level. Well, we have to go to the 20th century. We have to go to the late 20th century for this. Again, Stephen Hansen, love it, love it, love it. Uh, this is a play on no visible means of support. This is visible means of support, right? So we have this very young looking lady, very, you know, fingering her pearls and she's made up and she's beautiful and all this stuff, you know, resting on top of you know, kind of this dirty old man. So this is kind of the continuation now of, we've seen five generations of the same theme of unequal lovers. Well, another theme that's very common is uh, medicine. And this is actually, I, I, I took this photograph of a copy of a lithograph that was on my wall in my office for 36 years uh, by Honor Dumier. And humor in medicine is, is a universal topic, just like unequal lovers is a universal topic. It's universal because, you know, there's a lot of mystery in medicine and humor helps take the mystery out of medicine. Humor improves patient-physician communication. It narrows that gap. It shows caring, particularly if you use humor correctly. It relieves anxiety. And the bottom line is patient satisfaction and patient compliance is improved if you use humor. Now, humor can be a bit biting. When I saw this um, a couple months ago, I go, oh, I have to use this in my talk. This is, again, James Gilray. Um, and this is uh, 1802, this is, a, again, a, a colored uh, a lithograph, if you will, or a, a colored etching, if you will. Um, Gilray, or 1802. Those of you that are really good history people in the audience will remember 1796. 1796 is when Jenner first vaccinated somebody with cowpox. So this is six years after Jenner. Now, I have to digress a, a, a touch. Smallpox was deadly. Smallpox, 
pandemics and epidemics have been described since Roman time, since Egypt time. In fact, some of the, the pictures are, are even um, uh, the relief uh, stuff we saw in, in, in Egypt, they had pock marks on them where they had smallpox. But it was deadly. It was very, very deadly. So anything to, to take care of uh, smallpox was, was worthwhile. So here we have a physician, okay? And in the old days, we didn't have needles. A physician, you, you scratch the skin, you draw blood. You got to draw blood to vaccinate. And then he would use a little ladle or something and dip fluid from here, put it on the open sore. And that's how you vaccinate in the old days. Okay. Uh, I don't do that. I didn't do that too often. <laughs> Actually, I had a few people I wanted to do that too. <laughs> In fact, I wanted to do a, a, a major cut. But anyway, um, so anyway, so, so the physician has prepared the, the arm for inoculation. Now, the young boy here is holding this, this bucket. And you cannot read the bucket, but the bucket said, vaccine pox hot from the old cow. So that was the bucket. He was going to vaccinate with the bucket. Behind and to your right are people that have been vaccinated. And see, they have cows coming out of their arm, cows coming out of their blouse, cows coming out of their hips, cows coming out of their mouth, cows coming out of their nose. So this was, these are the old anti vaxxers, if you will. <laughs> you know? So when I, when I saw this, I just had to throw this. You could agree or disagree, but, but this is, you know, concerns about vaccines are hundreds of years old, let me just say, okay, hundreds of years old. Now, the only other thing that is impossible to see, but I find absolutely hilarious, is this picture in the background that we can't see very well. The picture in the background is a bunch of people kneeling before a golden cow. Okay, so this is James Gilray, again, a medicine, a humor in medicine. Again, I have to go back to our old friend Norman Walkwell. Uh, I don't know if this was one that Upjohn owned the original oil on campus. I don't know that. But this is a, just a great, great picture entitled Before the Shot. Uh, and, and it's not a vaccine. It's going to be a shot of penicillin. And I think most of us in this room can recall those shots were not fun. Um, in fact, we used to use an extra a little lidocaine solution uh, with uh, if you're giving big shots of penicillin. Anyway, so this is human medicine. Hippocrates, Hippocrates himself suggested that when interacting with patients, doctors should use both wit and humor. So even from Hippocrates using hip, wit and humor. So this is not fine art. Okay, this is the only non-fine art picture I have. And this is about stress. And stress, a simple definition of stress is the feeling that you're facing demands that exceed your ability to cope. So it exceeds your ability to cope with you can't deal with it. So there's individual differences. All of us have different levels of stress. I'm going to give an experiment for this group. This group is all has to go. You know, you're not invited. You have to go on a roller coaster with me. Everybody in this room. Okay. So some of you in this room are going to jump on the first two cars. Okay. Most of you are going to get in the middle cars. I'm going to be in the last car, okay? So those of you in the front two cars, you're waving your arms, and this is the greatest thing since chocolate milk, okay? Those of you in the middle car are saying, yeah, this is fun. I can do this again. You know, if someone pays me, I'll, I'll come back. I'm in the back, and I am cursing the person that made me do this, and I will never do this again as long as I live. The point is, it's the same stressor. It's the same stressor, but different responses. Okay, so what's stress to you may not be stress to me. Okay, there's good stress. And by and large, good stress is a protective mechanism. Good stress, we get this message in our brain, the, the amygdala, this little stress deep in the brain, you know, take the top of my ears and go through my eyes and it's right there. It is our stress part of the brain. And it sends a message to the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus sends a message to the pituitary. The pituitary releases these hormones, puts things in the bloodstream very, very fast. And these things in the bloodstream go to the adrenal glands, and the adrenal glands kick out epinephrine and norepinephrine. Why epinephrine and norepinephrine? Because 
We want our blood pressure to go up if we're going to fight or flee. We want our pulse rate to go up if we're going to fight or flee. We want more oxygen in our blood if we're going to fight or flee. We want more energy, so cortisol is also released. We need that sugar. Okay, so stress, good stress, is protective for us. It helps us. Bad stress, my buzzword, is slow-acting poison. Chronic stress is deadly. I can prove to you anyway, anyhow, that chronic stress shortens your lifetime. I can prove to you anyway, anyhow, that you have an increased risk of stroke, heart attack, uh, arrhythmias from chronic stress. I can prove to you that chronic stress affects just about every single organ in your body. So chronic stress is deadly. So why do we, why do we even care? Why, why are you pointing this out? Because humor, happiness, as a way to deal with chronic stress. So the physiologic effects of humor, well, we knock down those catecholamines. We knock down all the things that are raising our heart rate. We knock down all the things that raise our blood pressure. We even out, if you will. At the neuroendocrine level, remember, the very first thing we talked about in the lecture was those buzzwords, right? And the quiz was endorphins, opiates, right? Dopamine pleasure system. So it stimulates these things in the brain that, that are good for us, but it knocks down all the bad things in the, in the bloodstream for us. So humor is good. But what else about humor? Well, humor improves your immune response. In other words, it helps you fight infection. Humor uh, gives you a positive attitude. It makes you focus away from anger, away from guilt, away from frustration, away from negativity. It increases your pain tolerance. If you um, well, uh, have humor, you can stand with some pain much better. So it improves your pain tolerance. It changes your perspective from looking inward to looking outward. And the social benefits of benefit, those people that use humor uh, live longer. And it's just all the studies pretty much say that. Well, we've talked about 2D humor. There's a lot of 3D humor. I've shown you a lot of humor with Steve Hansen. Those are all 3D paper machines, but it's also in the bronze world. This is Kurt Newman. I find this. I find him a, a very a fun, fun guy. Uh, the legacy of Kurt Newman is going to be a creativity and a, uh, intelligence and humor. He found a whimsical way of looking at the world, and so 3D humor also is great. There's humor in other uh, venues, if you will. So uh, this is street art. This is this is basically considered graffiti. Uh, this is by Banksy. Banksy is a English, London, where most of his work was done. Now, no one really knows who Banksy is. Banksy did his last interview in 2003. He had a bag over his head. He said, the cops are after me. I can't see who I am. Uh, there's probably several artists that go work together as Banksy because they can put this up in, overnight. I mean, you know, three or four hours, it goes from blank, blank wall to, to this. So Banksy, uh, I think, uh, has a good sense of humor, but he also has a moral message. So sweeping it under the carpet is really the world's in, in action with regard to poverty, with regard to climate change. Well, there's also a lot of street art in the United States. This is a COVID, unknown artist uh, in, in LA. And remember that ridiculous uh, paper hoarding that went on. And remember, you know, um, you know the, the shady guys, the smugglers trench coat showing you, you know, Rolex watches and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, so this is a, a street art, but street art often, particularly during COVID, was, was beneficial. We're going to talk more about that in a second, but it kind of reminds us about safe behavior and reminds us about social distancing and so forth. Uh, the smuggler's uh, trench coat, I, I, you know, this is our, from our collection. This is from our collection, uh, from Steve Hansen. The smuggler's trench coat, you know, the, hey, buy this kind of thing, that's, that's a... a a modus of art that's been around forever. I just wanted to do a digression. Okay, carrying on with, with COVID. You know, one of the new things was memes. One of the new things was memes. So, you know, this was, remember, uh, you know, when we shut down. When we shut down. So this is a meme of the Mona Lisa after one month. Okay. Well, I think humor in the pandemic was really important. So pandemic humor is a coping mechanism. Humor in a pandemic, and, and Greg mentioned I talked about Dr. Gath, that's one of my favorite talks. Um, they used humor 
you know, to deal with the most horrible thing that the world has ever seen. We use humor during COVID. It's a way to validate our way for us to handle fear, grief, anxiety, and loneliness. Um, humor keeps us honest. It helps us uh, bridge the gap between the past, present, and future. It can look at reality and it can look at reality and say, okay, well, this isn't too bad. Or it can look at reality and say, reality is ridiculous. Or it can look at reality and say, we need to change. We need to do something beyond. And it allows us to process without being overwhelmed. So pandemic humor, I think, is, is very important. And a lot of it was in the uh, visual world. A lot of it is, is in memes uh, now. This is my favorite meme. I just, I just love this. Every time I, when I first saw it, I just couldn't help it. You know, occasionally I would put it as a screensaver when time was bad. Um, so um, I want to thank you very much for your attention. Um, I think I'm right on time. Uh, well, thank you very much for coming today. Questions. I have time for a couple of questions that some of you are going to answer or going to call on. <laughs> yes, please. The point of, and the answer is no. <laughs> the, the, the comment, which is perfectly correct, is that humor is a double-edged sword, and both for children and adults, uh, humor can use in, be used in a malignant way, in a cutting way, in a dangerous way. Um, typically, the, the studies that I was quoting uh, tend to look only at positive humor, a negative humor uh, as a form of bullying, um, they get figured out. And, and most of the studies I was looking at were in elementary school. Uh, that's, that's the age group. And um, the bullies got identified fairly quickly and they did not become leaders. They did not become, and they certainly had no increase in their cognitive capabilities. It's the positive humor that is, is beneficial. So your point is very well taken. Humor is a double-edged sword. And also, let me just add to that, um, as a physician, you know, I was very, very careful about humor. Very careful because, you know, what I thought might be humor. For, let me give you an example. <laughs> I never did this, but my example. Patient comes into my office and says, oh, Dr. Jim, I have ringing in my ears. What should I do? My response, answer it. <laughs> that is a very cutting response to somebody that has tinnitus. Okay. So while it's kind of funny, it's really not. So, you know, in many areas, childhood, childhood, in medicine, um, it's got to be positive or just leave it alone. I, I try to be very sensitive to that. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, back towards the beginning, you, you talked about the, the killer rabbits. Yeah. That immediately made me think of Monty Python <laughs> and the Holy Grail. Uh, you're correct. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is, that is hilarious. So You're exactly correct. In fact, Monty Python made that whole movie after the Killer Rabbits. Yeah. So, yes, Monty Python used that. And, and in fact, a lot of them were English. Uh, a lot of the Killer Rabbits were English. Yes, David. Uh, David Levine's caricature of LBJ, what did the nose represent? Oh. Um, David, I'm not sure I can tell you what the nose represented. He had a big nose. Um, you know, I always thought it was like a ski slope or something. <laughs> you know, I always thought it was, like, you know, going to ski down to, you know, to escape or whatever. But I don't have a specific answer for that. It looked like a cigar to me, but I couldn't figure out why LBJ and the cigar went together. Uh, yeah, I'm not even sure he was a smoker, but, but I, I always thought it was a ski slope and, and whatever ramifications that was, Scott. Oh, thank you. David, David, 
Scott thinks that it represented the Pinocchio, his line. And that makes sense. That makes, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Any other comments? Thank you all very much.